you're my first guest. So I was like, I said, I want to interview this person. And they were like, well, we have a list. I said, I want to interview oh, KT. Oh, thank Probably, you. Please. Very, and very flattered. Gary was like, what, what do you guys have in common? I'm like, <laughs> you know, because like, you know, me, yeah, me and KT used to power lift back in the day together. You know, yeah. we were big. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're already going. Yeah. Or so, I could just say I, I taught you at MIT when I was teaching there. Well, you're one see, of my well, students. Uh, <laughs> you're just so cool. <laughs> so are you. So, no, no, no. No, so like you. when you come on Gutfeld, that, <laughs> it's been described as I have a, a schoolboy crush. But <laughs> it's because when you're on, I, like, I'm worried about cussing everyone's you behavior. You're very polite. No, yeah, because it's, it, very it's polite. like it's so rare to see classy anymore. Well, like okay. the high level. You're just... You're James Bond, but you don't, but you come off very like, I'd be more worried about being assassinated by you <laughs> than I would be like, like a Mike Baker, you know, because you guys, yeah. like you're in that world. How, how He'd did probably some... want to have you know that he was going to assassinate yeah, him. Yeah, you would. I would have someone See, that's why I think you're more dangerous. <laughs> I think we know nothing, only what you show us. And we all fall for that, that charm. Now, how did you. Well, that's so nice. I just. It's so rare today to see that someone can, you didn't, you're not an extreme. Like, I don't feel like when you talk, I don't feel like I'm listening to like a Republican mm. or a Democrat. I feel like I'm listening to like a government official. Like you could easily be like a super spy for either side. <laughs> see the reaction you guys see that I, she won't break. <laughs> I just want you to know I am wearing a wire for this. So uh, I just, so am I, where did you, how did you get from like, where's your origin story? Oh, my! Oh, so I um, was born in 1951 and grew up in the Midwest. Parents hadn't gone to college, barely finished high school. And so I got a college scholarship to go to GW in Washington, D.C. So I did, but I had to work. Um, right. And in those days, women really didn't have the same economic opportunities, and they certainly didn't have the same academic opportunities. So I got a part-time job because I was a really good typist, and I got a job working in the west basement of the White House in the White House Situation Room which was three blocks from my dorm. So I worked for a guy by the name of Henry Kissinger, who had just been appointed Nixon's national security advisor. Wait a minute. So your first part-time job was working for Henry Kissinger? Well, after the I, age, I mean, I, no, I was, I was 18. Uh, yeah. I was so you were destined for the White House. <laughs> well, Henry Kissinger says years later, he said, I can't believe, no, I can't believe it. We hired you when you were a kid. And, and then we laughed because I was the easiest person to give a security clearance to. I don't know if you've ever gone through a security clearance. No, it's the White House. For some reason, I haven't been invited really yet. It's like, weird. Well, I just, yeah. Just, you're young. Uh, but you have to get, you know, all the places you've lived, everybody you've ever met. And so when I went for my White House job interview, um, they said, well, have you ever traveled? I see on the form you filled out, you don't have any travel. And I said, well, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. I've been to Illinois. I've been to Indiana. And I said, no, no, we mean foreign travel. And I said, oh, I don't even have a passport. And they said, you're hired, because it was the easiest security clearance. They made three phone calls, and they could find out I hadn't done anything ever, and so I was clean. So now you're in. I'm in. So I'm working for Henry Kissinger in 1970, and it was a time of enormous foreign policy advances. So we had the war in Vietnam that we were negotiating the end to. We had an opening to China. We had arms control agreements with the Soviet Union. Later, we had a peace agreement in the Middle East. It was a Middle East war. And in the middle of all of that, there was a um, Watergate crisis, and Richard Nixon ultimately had to was forced to resign other, uh, rather than face impeachment. So it was a really exciting time, a lot going on. And because it was, we were a very small staff, I mean, a tenth of the size it is today on the National Security Council, as long as you didn't screw up, you could get more and more responsibilities. So, I mean, Kissinger was my boss. And then he became a mentor later, and then ultimately a friend. So you go from Wisconsin to the world. Yeah, to the world. I didn't know enough to be scared. <laughs> I, it's just, it's so cool. Like, how do you, most people's paths are like all, like mine's all over the place. So you're now here. What, how do you go from the Wisconsin mindset, which is hard work and, yeah. and your faith and family, to understanding the scope of the world? Because it's very different. Like, I mean, how look, do you... But I, when I was growing up, I didn't even know people who had really graduated from college other than my teachers. So now you're dealing so, with world but I leaders. Didn't know to be, you know, I didn't know to be sort of intimidated. These are the first people I'd ever met in a professional capacity. So this and... is like the most politest form of like almost ignorance is bliss. 
Not- yeah, totally. I mean, I would see Richard Nixon every day. I would go into the Oval Office every day. Just, hey, what up? No, oh, here's your paper. You know, it was it was a very different time. It was much more informal than it then became okay. later. So now that we kind of know we must, was there ever a time when you were like handing papers like, you know, this doesn't feel right. Or like, this is some <laughs> weird stuff going on. In the Nixon and Ford administrations yes. and the Reagan administration, no, I thought it was all pretty good. So when the Nixon stuff dropped, were you surprised? Were you shocked? No. You mean that he had to resign because yeah. of Watergate? No, disappointed because there were so many great foreign policy initiatives that were just stopped. And then Jerry Ford came in as president. But it was an odd time because, again, there was, there was really, there were, the staff was about 20 people. And of all ages. 20 people. Well, in the West Wing of the White House, probably not even in the White House, the Kissinger operation in the White House. And, the, and during Watergate, so what happened is that President Nixon had a lot of staff people. And they had, um, the long and short of it was that they'd broken into the Democratic National Committee headquarters during the 1972 election. And Nixon covered it up. Everybody covered it up. But it all came out. And so as it was all coming out, all the people who were in the West Wing of the White House, you know, the chief of staff, the press secretary, they all would go testify. And then you never saw them again. They never came back to the White House. So by the time Nixon resigned in 1974, there were just a handful of people left in the West Wing of the White House, and Kissinger's staff being one of them. So, with the new, with him out, and for, did you transition out, or did you stay? No, you no, we staying? all stayed. I mean, all stayed uh, Jerry with... Ford, President Ford. Oh, because yeah, he went out. He, 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 he was vice president. He becomes president. Everybody stays. Kissinger stays. The staff stays, and then I think really great achievements in foreign policy. So I didn't leave until um, 1976. It was an election we had in. That's right, Jimmy Carter, right? Jimmy Carter. And I um, I wanted to go to grad school, and I wanted to go to Oxford. It was I wanted to apply for a Rhodes Scholarship, but it, they weren't open to women at that point, only men. And so I applied directly to Oxford. Even though you were literally the definition of, <laughs> yeah. of it. <laughs> it took them a while to get around to thinking women were equal citizens. And so I applied, got accepted at Oxford. Oxford gave me a scholarship. So I did graduate work at Oxford University. And then by then, Jimmy Carter's president. I'm trying to think, what shall I do next? All my pals from the Nixon and Ford administrations are not in the White House now. And so then I went to MIT for graduate school, studied nuclear weapons. And Soviet Union, China, did a little teaching. And then was writing my dissertation um, on the Chinese-Russian military alliance and then potential war when um, Ronald Reagan was elected. And then all my pals were back in, so I went back into government. Why is there not six movies about you? <laughs> like, they were is... waiting to find the right person to play me. <laughs> yeah, who would play you? What, I mean, you got that Joan Crawford elegance, but well, she you. was mean, at least I'm in her, her couple of roles. Joan, yeah. Remember uh, Mommy Dearest? That's yeah, my favorite right. movie of hers. Like, that was, she was mean. And then, of course, Chinatown, she was just weird. But um, it would have to be, who? fellas, anybody who could play her in a movie? No, 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 no. Maybe they like Jodie Foster, if she yeah. relaxed a little bit. Well, you can think about this, guys, and come back to me with yeah, the recommendations. She, it's Sigourney Weaver, I think. Oh, she's a friend, she, actually. Yeah, because Sigourney's like she's elegant, right, but also yeah. a badass. Because I feel like <laughs> she's not going to tell us in this interview, but you probably had a like your. I mean, I know our, our kids went, our daughters went to school together. Yeah, that's another thing. Now, while you're going to MIT, you're also raising a family, correct? Five kids. We have five kids. So I got married in the middle, late 1980s. I got married. My husband had two boys from his first marriage, so I helped raise them. And then we had two girls. And then my husband's first wife and her husband, second husband, they both died. And they had a little seven-year-old boy, so we adopted him. So then I've got five kids that when we put them all together. So yeah, a little Brady Bunch thing. It was a going total on. Brady Bunch thing, but it took it, you know it took a lot of effort. I mean, it, we laugh about it now, but as a result, our kids are really close, and we've had ups and downs. But I look back at my age and my husband, and we look back and say, "Wow, what a golden life we've had! We've had great careers. We've been very successful, but we have these spectacular children, and now we have nine and a half grandchildren. And we're nine really, and a half grandchildren." Yeah. Uh, how did, okay, so you're... So I'm a stay-at-home mom for 15 years. 
Walk well, not your church. average stay-at-home well, mom. But no, I Did you ever I, why you were doing the stay-at-home and get a phone call from oh, yeah. so an unlisted number? Like, listen, we got an issue in Paris. I need you. I, I'm sorry. I can't. I got soccer right now. Was it, were they, yeah, so they trying to pull you back like the godfather all the time? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. But I'm changing my daughter's diapers in 19... In, in, uh, yeah, she was born in 1990. So it was the first Iraq war. And I hear the TV is on in the other room. I'm changing her diapers. And I'm, well, I recognize that voice. And I went to look. I thought, oh, God, that guy was an idiot. I tried to fire him when he worked for me. And here he is leading the Iraq war. Oh, no wonder that so one So you're watching so well. news wars like I watch ESPN. Right. Like, wow. Like, that's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you you got the family. The and Brady Bunch, what made yeah. you get back in? Because you're. How, okay, let me just pause yeah. for you. Because you grew, you grew up in an era where women were basically second-class citizens. You could be secretaries. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like I mean, a secretary or a wife. You could be a secretary or a nurse in some cases. I mean, I, so I would go to college, right? I got a degree in Chinese studies. I could get a job working as an assistant or a secretary to the guy who had the same degree. It probably didn't do as well as I did. But that was my job opportunity. And it wasn't the same. I mean, it, you had to really be smarter, better, work harder, and then have a lot of good was breaks, there a lot of uh, Was there a lot of protests from women in, in your college no, and stuff you, like it is today? No, not then. You didn't, th you didn't think you had any rights. I mean, you were just happy to be in a room where you weren't getting coffee for everybody. Wow. And when you see people complain today about opportunity, do, do you just have to laugh and shake your head? Because it's nothing like that anymore. No, but I, you know, I've got two daughters who are um, in their 30s, and they're both very successful. One is went to the Naval Academy, and she's a lieutenant commander in the reserves, and she's a state representative from Sarasota to Tallahassee. Three little boys, you know, three, two, and one. And then my other daughter, who's a Bitcoin blockchain, I don't know what she does, but it seems to be quite lucrative and successful. So I look at them, and I think, wow, they have so many great opportunities. Their problem is... They feel they have to do it all. They have to be married. They have to have kids. They have to have a career. Uh, well, someone kind of set the bar kind of high. Well, but for me, it was easy. I just had the career. I had the family. And then I had the career again. On top of you're breaking glass barriers all the time. Yeah, it was always a glass barrier. There was always a glass ceiling. Yeah, always. Because, uh, you know, did, was there ever a time where you your frustrations would show? Because a lot of times, like, I would always, when I was younger, equate to something not going my way based off the color of my skin. Mm. Or, you know, you get, you, get, you get those voices around you all the time that will, because misery loves company, you know, and, mm -hmm. and failure is a huge part of success because I've failed a lot. I'm, I'm sure you got failures, and even sometimes you were yeah. given failures you didn't earn. Sure. What was, what was the toughest one that you oh, can it was all of? this, you know, all of the sexual harassment stuff was kind of a problem. So back then, it was just... <laughs> you had no rights. You had no rights. <laughs> you had absolutely no... If you complained, working. you would be fired, and then you would have like a big X on your name. No. You'd so just... it was like a scarlet letter. Like if you spoke She's up trouble. and was like, hey, yeah, Johnson, keep your hands to yourself and mm -hmm. just take the notes, then it would be, you're she's fired, trouble. And, and she's trouble. And she's trouble. We don't want to have... So I never wanted to... So I always was able to kind of dodge and weave my way around it. And I always had really good mentors who helped. I mean, Henry Kissinger being one. Secretary of Defense, Cap Weinberger was another one. And then I got some pretty serious academic credentials. So when I worked at the Pentagon, where there were no there were no women in any senior positions, and I was a Pentagon spokesman, and I was a senior speechwriter, a deputy assistant secretary of defense. And the fact that you know I, I could be pretty tough, and I had a pretty solid academic background, and I could kind of outsmart these guys, a lot of them. It was you know I saw to work for it every single day, but I was very lucky to have opportunities like that. When you hear people say today when uh, especially the, the new thing is that we're all professional victims now right yeah when you hear people complain about opportunities today mm -hmm. being someone who had several lanes how hard is that pill for you to swallow when I you hear don't. someone go like <laughs> it's just not fair for me you know like is this opportunity today aren't the same because i'm a woman or i'm a person of color or yeah. or, or whatever when you hear them spew those things do you ever just want to like just sit down for a minute and let me just tell you 10 no. minutes of a story of my no life. i think to myself suck it up but um I must say that when our kids were little, we had a big sign that was right over the kitchen table that said, no whining. And so as a result, I've had five terrific kids who don't whine. I probably need to get, I remember our house was like, no, if you have a complaint, it was like, mom's always right. If you have a complaint, see rule one. So it was like, no matter what, it always went back to I think to I'd her. have a lot in common with your mom. Yeah. I like, really she didn't, get along. We didn't, we didn't get to negotiate. There was not, 
So did you have an adversary? Like, was there was some foreign, like whenever this individual came to town, you were like, oh man, we got to watch this guy. Oh, you mean like a foreign leader? who was A foreign leader that just particularly rubbed you the wrong way or like they had their their version of you, let's say the Russian version of you. I mean, you could always- Well, there's only one you. No, see, the thing is about foreign policy and defense issues, I mean, they're pretty, it's pretty, you can study them, you can learn them. The one thing I learned from, from Henry Kissinger was don't just look at it from your perspective. Get inside his skin. How does he see it? What's important to him? And then you try to have a negotiation. Because if you just think, oh, well, he's wrong, it gets you nowhere. You well, want to be able person... to understand. Because then he thinks you're wrong. And so what do you do? You know, then you go to war? No. And the other thing I learned, I think, probably from Reagan was, first of all, have a sense of humor. But also, be, don't you don't have to go to war. That you want to have a strong national security and defense. But the way you beat the bad guys is use America's strengths, which is our economy our political system, and our technology. And that's how we won the Cold War. And I think that was a lesson that, Don, that Donald Trump, even though he doesn't give credit to um, Ronald Reagan, but I think it's one that he's embraced as well. Why, you know, I, I keep going back and forth over the, the Trump administration because I always try to look at what the real issues were mm-hmm. opposed to like, and it's, it just looks to me like, could, if he would have ran Democrat, yeah, do you think he would have this much venom? From mainstream media, because oh, I for think a, he would have the venom no matter what. no matter what, because yeah. he was Democratic for a long. Yeah, he was Democrat mean, he's for a like while. A New York he was Republican. Yeah, but he was like liberal. America's. It was like in every, <clears throat> in every young kid, like I was growing up in my college dorm, it was two posters that you would see all the time. It was either, either like Trump, yeah. or it was like Scarface. It was like <laughs> no, but I'm just saying it was like those are like the because you wanted to be like one or the other, like yeah. you know Scarface. I still don't understand why. Even watching the movie back, it was just the, his idea, yeah. his yeah. thirst to be up top, and yeah. he was tough. He still died though, so that's like kind of the message you need to get. Like his lifestyle wasn't really one you. Frank to was like. actually right. <laughs> <laughs> so, whereas Donald Trump, it was like the ultimate of success, you know, because yeah, he right. was. They were having him in Christmas movies. Yeah, like exactly. he was America's rich guy. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, he wasn't. And I was thinking the other day that someone was asking me, and I was like, I wonder if he would have ran as a Democrat. Would it have been the same thing? See, I think the reason that it's not just the Democrats and the media, but a lot of conventional establishment Republicans went after him is because he wants to drain the swamp. I mean, look, I was a Republican forever. I worked for Republican presidents, card-carrying member of the Republican establishment, you know, member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, But... Once we got into the forever war in the Middle East with the Iraq war, I broke with the Republican Party. I, and not, not that I'm any kind of Democrat, but I thought these forever wars were leading nowhere. We were wasting money. We were wasting American lives, and we were getting nothing for it. And so that's when I actually started paying attention to Donald Trump, who was not in politics at that point. But he was starting to say the stuff that I thought made a lot of sense. So when, then when he ran, um, you know, I, I gave him some foreign policy briefings. We talked, and I was very impressed because he was breaking every rule um, of traditional foreign policy. But I thought every rule needed to be broken. And I do, think do you think we've here. gotten to the point now to where, because you talk about the intangibles, right? Because America's strength was economy. Yeah. I don't get the sense it is anymore. I don't feel currently mm. that when America steps in, that everyone's acting like they did before. No, certainly. because we're even seeing it, even with. Situation where Israel, Israel's almost like, you know what? Say what you're going to say. <laughs> you just sit over there. You know, and we're seeing like North Korea, we're seeing all the countries. America's not having, the checkbook's not meaning as much anymore or the right. lack of the checkbook. And you called it. And you've seen it. What do you think the biggest change is? You know, it's a whole lot of things that happen all at once <clears throat> and then lead to a slow decline. I think a lot of it, it starts with failed wars whether it was in Afghanistan, Iraq, I'd go back to Vietnam, um, the forever wars. The other part of it was the economic part. And, and the United States really controlled the world after World War II because we were the surviving country that was still rich, hadn't been bombed, our economy was intact. And then we could be very generous to our adversaries and to get them to the point where they were strong democracies, we'd all be trading partners. And that was the theory. I think where it all started falling apart was about 2000, when we looked at China and we saw third world country, poor country, 
you know, we'll, we'll help you join the international community, just like we helped Japan, Germany, the war-torn countries of Europe. And then you're going to be a trade, you'll be successful, you'll have a middle class, you'll have a thriving economy, and you'll be a trading partner of ours. And then, well, there'll never be another war. And that was the mistake everybody made, because that was our plan, Republican right. and Democrat. That was not China's plan. China's plan was that it would become- They want to be number one. Yeah, they want to be number one, and they th and they are going around the world and saying to the world, America's days are done. We're, there, we're, we, China, are the rising empire, and America's the declining empire. Whose side do you want to be on? Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think, because I think, why is it that we're not hearing this type of talk or this type of defensive strategy from the left? Because whatever your policies are, mm -hmm. you still don't want to <clears throat> watch the world slip through your fingers, right? I mean, irregardless, yeah. isn't pol foreign policy the one thing that it shouldn't be partisan? Just, yeah, but that really hasn't been the case since. What Vietnam do you think the big difference? What's the big wedge then? What's the difference? Okay, you want the wedges now? I mean, because to yeah. me, you could get this American leadership back in six months. And the way, the key to all of this is something that we didn't have the ability to do 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and that's energy. So if you look at um, how did Reagan win the Cold War, he understood that the Soviet Union needed energy prices really high. They didn't make anything else the world wanted. They just exported oil. And if oil prices were high, they rebuilt they their military, right. they invaded their neighbors. So we got the Saudis to pump a lot of oil. The price went from 40 to $18 a month and not, uh, $18 a barrel in nine months, and the Soviet Union was broke. And that's how we won the Cold War. Now, could you do that again today? Yeah, and it's actually in some ways easier because about 10 or so years ago, American engineers and scientists and oil guys, they realized that we have, we could frack. Fracking is basically getting oil and natural gas out of rocks. Right. And it turns out our rocks are the best of anybody's rocks in the world. So we realized how to do it. We just couldn't figure out how to do it cheaply enough to make it competitive. But what Donald Trump came in, and he was the first guy to understand the significance of it, we could do it, and we could do it cheaply. So what is, how does that change the whole constellation of the world? Well, if the United States becomes not just energy independent, but energy dominant. In other words, we have so much oil and natural gas, we can power the world for hundreds of years at a cheaper price than anybody else can. That means we set the global price. We can set it really low. Guess who that bankrupts? Iran. It bankrupts Russia. You don't have an invasion of Ukraine. Russia Saudi can't Arabia chills out. Saudi Arabia chilled out. Saudi Arabia needed a peace agreement because they knew they couldn't just export oil forever. Iran was broke. It wasn't paying for Hamas or Hezbollah or anybody. So then you realize that, A, it's good for the American economy. B, it's terrific for vanquishing our adversaries. You can go to Europe, a country which needs energy to be imported, and you say to Europe, get off of Russian oil, get off of Middle East oil, use American natural gas, it's clean, it's cheap, we'll help you. And then you would have an independent Europe that didn't have to be blackmailed by, by Russia. And then you go to China, one of the most energy needy countries in the world. And if the United States is the dominant energy supplier to the world, that's a lot of leverage to have over China. To me, it's a no brainer It's like I'm... So the administration gets in, the first thing they do is they shut off our pipeline. Yeah, exactly. Which then Duh. raises the price of everything. Sure does. So if anybody at home is not figuring this out, like, <laughs> I mean, my mind was blown. Like, I'm thinking that we needed to figure out alien technology or something to blackmail, or maybe that's what they got. And it was very simply, <clears throat> like, I could do that. Yeah. As an executive order. That's like 15 yeah. minutes. It's not and a even, it's, 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 not, it's a no-brainer. And, and the other thing is, so I think that, because the Democrats have become so enamored with their new religion is climate change, right? And so anything that looks like it's going to rely on fossil fuels is really bad. And so they've all gone down that road. And so America, which has this amazing advantage of any other country in the world, the energy that we have, instead of saying, hmm, I don't think we have windmills and renewables yet. We don't have the infrastructure for that yet. We might in 10 years, but we don't today. So how do you get from today with fossil fuels to there? You have a bridge technology. And you have what's to work that? together, yeah. Oil, and that, not even oil, it's clean American natural gas. So what we should have always said to the, to the Green Revolution is, let's get a bridge technology. Let's get a bridge energy source, which would be clean American natural gas. It's cheap. It's reliable. It's safe. We could export it to the world. And that way you get a triple win, Right. I mean, you know this from sports, right? Yeah. The biggest thing you want is a triple win. So you have the win that bad guys are vanquished. Your economy is terrific. 
and then you're actually doing something good for the environment. Okay, so I guess when I hear you say that, because that makes perfect sense to me, then I look at why they don't. I yeah. think why they don't. I think it's because I always looked at the green movement, as you called it, as an old money hustle, meaning they didn't they don't care about how many birds get killed by windmills. <laughs> they want oil's money. They want that That's establishment's pretty, money. They want to. Yeah. They want their money because all of the all the green stuff costs more, yeah. <laughs> and you can't build the green stuff without still using them. But it's a, almost a war because. The, like the whole thing, like I just saw, was it the Hertz CEO bought a bunch of electric cars and no one rented them. <laughs> Nobody wants his ass out of job. <laughs> uh, but I don't feel bad for CEOs because I'm sure he had a wonderful package. <laughs> I'm sure it was like five million, you know, firing package. Like we need to get negotiate like CEOs and you get fired. They get tons of money. But you see, you just broke down a solution. Yeah. What, and you just did that hanging out with me in what looks well, you're like a, smart a mafia hit room here. Why are we not hearing these on TV? So I'm not worried about. Oh, you're not at all. No, no, you got (laughs) Rocco standing over there. I see him. Hey, Hey. (laughs) he's looking at you. There's no plastic. We're okay. But you just gave me a solution. (laughs) Yeah. And I think we got to throw shots back. Why are we don't hear these solutions on TV? Instead of having six panel members come on and talk for two minutes, KT in a comfortable chair, we throw some stuff on you. And there's wisdom because you have great wisdom. And I'm sure there are untapped resources of men and women who have done the work because I always say like it's the people you don't know and see in front of the camera Mm -hmm. are the people you want to know and get in front of the camera because you did the work like how many would you do a lot of press briefings back in the day or yeah I was a press secretary to Pentagon you come out and you speak but what you also did behind the scenes too right oh sure I mean I wrote my own stuff if that's what you yeah Yeah, you didn't have a ghostwriter no no why is our (laughs) (laughs) why is it so hard for today's people in your jobs to give us straight answers. Okay, you got the point a minute ago when you said it's a side hustle. It's yeah. a hustle. Guess where all the money is spent for the Green New Deal? I went through zooming on China. The, it's all China. China yeah. All the stuff is manufactured yeah, in China. China. So <laughs> it's, who gets rich? China gets rich. Who gets rich? The guys investing in China. So and then it's, it's the economic Al Gore's of the world get to make a couple oh, of documentaries, make some money. I know, then they have private, private jets. jets. They made <laughs> yeah. more money. <clears throat> fighting the green fight, you got rich. Yeah. Which means you were hustling the green, because you shouldn't get rich if you're fighting for something. If anything, it should have been, you know, because I'm still, and here's the thing about me. I am an outdoorsman, and I'm a huge animal. Like, I think Sir David Attenborough mm, is the yeah, greatest absolutely. voice. Absolutely, documentaries. And, and uh, I, I don't think I've ever missed one. Like, it, yeah. And it's like mandatory watching in my, in my household. My kids have to know the same stuff, and then uh, I'm an animal buff and I remember oh polar bears are dying out and this that and it's all over their population's up because they figured it out because the, the world <laughs> like the polar bears figured it out we couldn't yeah. they just realized the ice melts faster so they eventually figured out well that means the seals have to come in more to, to have their babies so the bears figured it out it took them a little bit and we always videotaped <laughs> the dumb lost one that was starving that wasn't going to make it in the first right. place the animals figured out because the earth is always changing. like George Carlin. He called it like yeah. he, he told everyone that earth was not designed to, to enjoy static. life. No, earth, the static. earth doesn't like life. The earth has been ending lives since jump. Like <laughs> we've had five mass extinctions mm-hmm. in this, in our planet's history so far, there'll be six and seven. It's just not everybody's going to go. We'll probably yeah. go. And then who's ever's next, maybe squirrels. Cause I kind of have a thumb. Who knows? But like, we don't know who's next, but you can't do anything about it, but you can create this facade that somehow you can change. You're all powerful and you yes, can change. Yes, you can, we can World history change, and... we can save the earth. So how about we just adapt and figure it out? Yeah, we might have to live yeah. underground for a while and stop building houses on the beach. <laughs> See, that's the one thing I do. I See, you have so much common sense. I mean, this is what's so frustrating when you I, watch the panel of five This is why I yell at the TV da, 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 da. so much. Yeah. And I see the people going on like, if your insurance company will not cover your home by the water, mm-hmm. the insurance company knows that that area is changing. <laughs> if the insurance company will cover your house by the beach, you probably right. got a little bit of time. Right. Because where I live in Louisiana, they just raise all the insurance oh, yeah. on the homes. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, it's time to move. And they're like, why? Yeah. I just feel it's time to move. Like I, <laughs> Well, I can still get a good price. Well, I still get a yeah, yeah. Why, why my house is not floating away. So I see it. You just broke down. Like, that clip I'm using forever because you just literally solved the world problem in about what, what was that? 
Minute and 30 seconds, fellas? Less, does anyone here want to argue that? I don't have a counterpoint for that. Anyone? No? It's a no -brainer. Why is there not a movie about you? And it would happen you? so quickly. You are, <laughs> James Bond ain't got shit on you. I don't understand why we don't have. We good toys. Yeah, well, there should be a, K, I mean, we, we can combine, yeah. since everyone's about Barbie, there needs to be a KT, I mean, because you're a world scholar and you just solved the world's problem like that. It's common sense. And then you're still going to be a so grandma and as soon as we're done here. Yeah, exactly. I'm... How do, if you could give someone, balancing it is tough. Like I'm like this. What do you mean balancing your life? The family. Oh, yeah, the yeah, profession. Yeah, yeah. Was there ever, did you ever have to make choices to sacrifice one? Of course you did. But of like course. what was one of the toughest ones as far as work? Was there, had you not had been such a strong family, mm -hmm. which were there certain, would you yeah. seek a higher office? Why did we not get VP? Why did we not get you running for president? Because you were groomed to lead. So I don't understand. Why did you not take the just, next step? Yeah, I think Or I just, just checking the water still? Because no, you're still a young no. lady. Thank you. Um, but I think what happened in my era, and I've talked to my daughters about this, is I was always, you know, what's the next thing? Like you say, yeah. Edward, you know, I can do this. I can do that. And I was, there was a certain point, and it even happened five years ago, ten years ago. It's not your time. It's not your time. It will be women's time, but it's not your turn yet. And then you kind of believe it. Okay, fine, fine, fine. And then at a certain point, you're too old. <laughs> you know, you passed your time. So I think that that was a frustration. But for me, no, I've lived an amazing life. Well, and I've got no these question. daughters who are rock stars. And my sons are terrific too. But um, but I'm particularly happy that my daughters have opportunities that I didn't have. Okay, let's just say in a crazy world, let's say that um, President Trump is yeah. reelected. Mm -hmm. And that phone rings, and this time now you're changing grandbaby diapers <laughs> or whatever. It says, we need you. You hop it in the game or you... Are you oh, who knows? You know, that's so many ifs, ifs, ifs. She, she, but I have she. talked to President Trump, and I continue to talk to him. I mean, and I think he's just... You know, I saw him a couple weeks ago, and he said, you know, we were right. And I thought about it, and, we, and he was. And I thought about it, I said, you know something? He was right. He was right about it. All the foreign policy stuff. He was right about the economic stuff. He was right about Mexico. He was right about China. Was that a surprise for you that he, given his background, that he was so attuned to what's... No, because I think he approached all of it with a different... He was looking at everything from a different perspective, which is the economic perspective. A businessman in the White He's House. He's a businessman. The so lawyers are going to have a field day with that. A businessman in the White House who says, what do we want? I mean, how do we solve Ukraine? Get him to the negotiating table. And they're going to negotiate peace. And then Ukraine does really well in the peace. Russia doesn't do so well. Right. You win on the economic grounds. Reagan understood it. The problem is that the United States, we should not be in these wars. We're not good at it, these forever wars. We're not good at it. We're not good at bossing people around, telling them what kind of government they should have. What we're really good at is technology and our free market capitalism and the economy. That's where we should be. That's our competitive advantage. Okay, one more question. Just politically term limits do you think if there was term limits in the house in the senate that would help individuals in your line of work get their jobs done more Absolutely. easily more without having to deal with those because you'll like Absolutely. you'll be trying to work something but you have to deal with a career senator that might not one of his donors <laughs> might you know cut off some of his money or his speaking fees uh which are astronomical yeah was that a was that a thing did you ever have to do battle with your own even of republicans course, Repu oh, oh, yeah, yeah a thousand. for sure. No, term limits would be great. I mean, I look at all the states that have them. Florida, where my daughter is a state representative, they have term limits. And as a result, it's probably one of the best governed states in the, in the country. Term limits would be great because you know why? By the time people go to Washington, I was years ago, somebody asked me if I would, I mean, 40 years ago, would you want to run for Congress? I thought about it. I think, you know, you run for an office because you want to change things. You think, well, that's how I'm going to make change. But then after a while, the office changes you. And so you're not a crusader anymore. You're just a crusader for getting reelected. And what does yeah, that mean? Yeah, because you get in it. And then once you get the job, mm -hmm. then the next day is you start your campaign again. Yeah. And it's and really hard to give up power. And it's hard to take the gutsy decisions. We, know, I we think see that's them why... literally dying on the job. Oh, yeah, Mitch McConnell went yeah. into the Matrix. There are they, they're all going out in a coffin. Nobody's going no, out. And, and still voting. Action. Yeah. Like John McCain, who I love to death. I like they, if, if the only way you can vote is one thumb up, rest his little soul, like it's not. And I loved him. I thought he was 
he was I thought he was a fair man and I agree he was a very good man and um but I didn't need to see him at his end making decisions like I think that's the biggest the biggest thing yeah, think about America what are we really good at we're innovative we're creative we don't look behind I mean if you go to Facebook and somebody says where are you from you don't say where my grandparents were born you just right. say where I live right now right you know you're always looking ahead and if you have a really old leadership population you're not looking ahead very far that's no, why they're I just think trying to make sure it stays off the ground. Term limits are terrific because it keeps it churning, and you get younger people, and they're innovative and they're exciting, and that's how America survives. You know, so let me just tell you. So when I I went through the Trump administration, I got beaten up pretty badly by the Mueller investigation. They slapped me around. Ultimately, they basically well, what they said was, "We want you to plead guilty to a crime you didn't commit, like perjury." I said, "I'm not going to do it." Or you implicate Donald Trump. And I said, I'm not going to implicate him. And it was a really hard time because they know they can bankrupt people. They know you haven't done anything wrong, but they can cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And there was a certain point where I said to my husband, God, maybe I should just plead guilty for saying anything. So they, they stop coming after me. When we're gonna, I'm going to go to my grave defending myself from Sabrina's. And Alan said, no, nope, you can't do that. You'll never live with yourself. You're just going to have to tough it out. And so I did. I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bend. You're not going to break me. If you want to come after me, orange jumpsuits, I'm, it's a good color. But they, then they gave up. But what I did do was I left the country with my husband and we went to, we took an airplane to the West coast of Scotland. And then we got in a car and we drove to the shore and then we got on a ferry boat and we then went to the furthest island. You're not on the lamb, right? You just. just <laughs> not on the okay, lamb. Right. This was a voluntary thing. Okay. The Mueller investigation okay. said, we're not going to charge you with okay. a crime. Okay. But I've had to get my feet under myself. And so I'm sort of thinking, what's wrong with America? We've never been in a situation like this. Gosh, I always thought I would be Secretary of State. Maybe I'm not going to be. And I was just sort of real. It was a really hard moment. And then I realized, you know, America is supposed to go through these periods because our founding fathers understood we would always be changing. We would always be a dynamic society, whether it was how we earned our living where, you know, the demographics, the geographics, national origin, and they set up a system where we would have revolutions at the ballot box, that, but we could throw out the bombs because the elites just got too entrenched. And we have, with great regularity, done it. We did it in the American Revolution, right? What was that about? Getting rid of the king, the right, elites. Yep. And then, you know, 40 years later, the guys who were the original revolutionaries, they'd gotten pretty comfortable in power. So we have the Jacksonian Revolution in the 1830s and 40s got rid of the previous guys, new guys come in. And then we continue to do it after the Civil War. We did it the Industrial Revolution. We did it after the Great Depression. We did it to a lesser extent during Reagan. I think that's what we're going through now. We are a country going through enormous change. And it, we have done it every time. I mean, sometimes we've gone to war. Some, but it's always nasty. There's always a lot of collateral damage. It is not done in one election. It takes a decade to have that kind of change. But and this is where I got great enthusiasm for the future. That's America's secret sauce. You know, other okay. countries, they have, they rise, they have their moment and shining, but then they decline. America, we have our, we rise, we shine, we decline a little bit, and then we rise again. We reinvent ourselves as a nation, just like we do as individuals. And no other country in the history of the world has done that. That's American exceptionalism. That's our secret sauce. So we should be good right now because we're just in the middle of the, this We're in the middle of a recipe. nasty fight. Yes. When you look at the Mueller report, and um, I know I said the last question, but I can't help it. And you just, you just, I'm a sponge here. I think history will look differently on that whole thing. Oh, yeah, sure. Almost, it will be buyer's remorse, I think, for a lot of people that yeah. sacrifice their integrity for. Oh, you mean the people who were broke? Yeah, I, I think and when I they do. look yeah. back at it, not now. No. But when history looks at it, it was a mistake. I think they'll look at it very differently. Yeah. Like, and I think a, what a it polite is, coup during an election, yeah. the ramifications are so far going up. Right, right. You don't see it until you see it in retrospect. Right. And the high, I think what that was was again, why did the bad guy? Why did they hate Donald Trump so much? Yeah. It was because he wanted to break through this elite establishment that's running things. I don't think the enemy is the Democrats or the Republicans or even the Chinese. A lot of it is the bureaucratic state, which is expensive wants to boss everybody around. It's the nature of it to get more powerful, more expensive, and into more areas of your life. That's the real hard part. I don't think it's Republicans and Democrats. I think it's the incumbents in Washington, whether they're in the bureaucracy where you can't fire anybody, 
you can't, I mean, they have cost of living increases, they have gold-plated health insurance and retirement plans. These guys are around forever. So I'm saying, so we have term limits that will, so you, that solves that so much of your, everything. What you told us earlier, we're in good shape. Yeah. The amazing summer. Yeah. It'd be a heck of a time, won't it? <laughs> will you please sign my book? I'd be honored. Book? Thank you. And where can everybody get this bad boy? Oh, you can. Yeah. It's a, a couple of years old, but it's actually even better now. Um, and you can get it anywhere books are sold. KT, thank you so much for doing thank this. Thank you. We are all smarter. Everybody in here is smart. Who's going to go home and I like try to, I'm going to brag. I'm going to try to act like <laughs> before the interview, like, oh, by the way, you know, I can solve this thing for you right now, Gutfeld. Like that, right? Just like that. Like what? Like that. Like what? Like he said that. <laughs> thank, thank you. Katie, you're the best. No, you are the best.